Hello, I'm Dr. Maurice Dupre, and in this section we're going to discuss the area between two curves. Let's look at a picture of how we deal with finding the area between two curves. So for the area between two curves, our two curves are generally given to us as graphs of functions y equal g of x here and y equal f of x above the y equal g of x. These are two functions then and our horizontal extent will be specified by uh, vertical lines x equal a and x equal b. And so the area trapped between these two vertical lines and between these two graphs is capital A given by, capital A is the definite integral from little a to little b of the quantity f of x minus g of x dx, and of course that's provided if g of x is less than or equal to f of x for all x between a and b. In other words, in order for this formula to hold, it's assumed that the graph of f is always above the graph of g during the interval from a to b. Now, it's not hard to see why this is true, because remember, the definite integral of a function gives you the area under the curve if it's always above the x-axis. So if I provisionally put in an x-axis here down below the graph of g, you can easily see that the area between the two curves is the area under the graph of f, which is the definite integral of f of x alone, minus the area under g, which is the definite integral of g of x dx. So in other words, the area between is the definite integral of f of x from a to b minus the definite integral of g of x from a to b. But of course, the definite integral of f minus the definite integral of g is the same as the definite integral of f minus g. Now, if the x-axis were to go through anywhere else, I could add a constant to both f and g, the same constant. The difference would then cancel that constant out. But in terms of the graph, adding a big positive constant would shift both graphs up above the x-axis without changing the area. So this formula has to be true no matter where the x-axis goes. Well, let's look at an application of this formula to compute an area. We want to find the area between the graph of y equal x and y equal x square between vertical lines x equal 2 and x equal 3. And here I've sketched the curves. Of course, y equal x squared is our parabola, and y equal x is our diagonal line with slope 1. Now, if x is a number bigger than 1, then obviously x squared is bigger than x, and we all know that that parabola is way above the diagonal line as x gets much bigger than 1. So consequently, between the limits x equal 2 and x equal 3, the x square is always above y equal x. And so the area shown in blue-green here between these two curves is the definite integral from 2 to 3 of x squared minus x dx. We get our limits here from these two equations. Now, that's easy to do. The antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3 minus the antiderivative of x is x squared over 2, and that's to be evaluated from 2 to 3. So we put in the upper limit 3 into our antiderivative. We get 27 thirds minus 9 halves. And then we subtract what we get by putting 2 into our antiderivative, which would be 8 thirds minus 4 halves. And so that ends up being 19 thirds, 27 thirds minus 8 thirds being 19 thirds. And the minus 9 halves minus minus plus 4 halves is minus 5 halves. And so that's 23 sixths is what we get for this area trapped between the two curves in this case. Now let's look at another example. Let's find the area between y equals tangent of x and y equals 2 cosine x for 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi over 4. This one's a little trickier because we're dealing with trig functions and we have to be very familiar with trig functions to figure out which is on top where. Let's begin by graphing the tangent of x. So I'll provisionally put in a dotted line, y equals 1. And what about for 
the horizontal direction, the important numbers for trig functions are pi over 4, pi over 2, pi, 2 pi, and so forth. And so pi over 2, remember, is certainly bigger than 1, but pi over 4 is less than 1. So notice on this scale that would be 1. So uh, pi over 2 would be about a little more than 1 and a half, be about here. And pi over 4, consequently, is back about here. Now, tangent of pi over 4 is 1, so the graph of tangent goes through that point. On the other hand, you might recall that uh, the graph of the, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, which is 1 over cosine squared. And when I put x equals 0 there, cosine of 0 is 1, so the slope of the tangent is 1 right at the origin. So it's going to go through here diagonally. And on the other hand, since tangent is sine over cosine and cosine pi over 2 is 0, as we approach pi over 2, we remember that tangent goes off to infinity. So this graph comes up here like this, passes through there diagonally, and then starts to curve back up, goes through that point, and heads on up asymptotically to plus infinity. And so you see during the interval 0 to pi over 4, the tangent of x is going to be between height 0 and 1. Now let's look at the other curve, y equal 2 cosine x. When x equals 0, cosine 0 is 1, so 2 cosine 0 is 2, so it's way up here, and so we know that then it starts to come down, and so our question might be, does it come down far enough to go below, or is it always above? In order to find out, all we have to do is plug in x equal pi over 4, so when I compute 2 cosine pi over 4, Remember, to compute cosine of pi over 4, you're just looking at a little 45 degree right triangle. We can think 1, 1 square root of 2. Cosine pi over 4 is 1 over root 2. So we get 2 divided by root 2, which is root 2. And of course, root 2 is above 1. And so you see this cosine curve doesn't ever come down far enough to get below the tangent curve in our interval 0 to pi over 4. And so here, in effect, is the little area that we're going to commute, compute, the area between tangent of x and 2 cosine x. And so what we see is that area is the definite integral from 0 to pi over 4 of 2 cosine x minus tangent of x dx. Okay, well now that we've done these calculations to assure ourselves that we have the right definite integral to compute, I'm going to erase our picture and these computations here and let's compute our definite integral. So what's the antiderivative of cosine? Well, we recognize that sine. So we have 2 sine x minus, and what about tangent? Remember, tangent is sine over cosine. And so what we get here is integral 0 to pi over 4 of sine x over cosine x dx. And now, the simple way to integrate sine x over cosine x dx is by substitution, set u equal to cosine x, then du is negative sine x dx. And so, since du is negative sine x dx, let's put the negative sign here inside as a factor of negative 1, and we see the numerator is our du, our denominator is u, and so we end up with, well, of course, our sine x is evaluated from 0 to pi over 4, and we have 2 sine x evaluated from 0 to pi over 4 plus the integral 0 to pi over 4, negative 1 sine x over cosine x dx, and let's make our substitution. When u is 0, when x is 0, excuse me, u is cosine 0, which is 1. So 
we have integral from 1, and when cosine, when x is pi over 4, cosine pi over 4, remember, is 1 over square root 2. And so we have du over u. Now, the antiderivative of, excuse me, our antiderivative 2 sine x evaluated from 0 to pi over 4 is simply twice the sine of pi over 4 because subtracting sine 0 is subtracting nothing. So we have 2 sine pi over 4. What's sine pi over 4? Look at that little triangle again. Pi over 4 right here, 1 over root 2. So we have 2 times 1 over root 2 plus the natural logarithm of u is the antiderivative of 1 over u, and that's evaluated from 1 to 1 over root 2. 2 over root 2 is a root 2, and natural log of 1 over root 2 is minus the log of root 2 itself. The natural log of 1 is 0, and so this is our final answer, root 2 minus natural log root 2. Or we could think of that, if you want to use a law of logarithms, the natural logarithm of the square root of something is 1 half the natural log of the number itself. So we have root 2 minus 1 half natural log 2, and if we put that into our calculator and calculate it, we find that's approximately 1.0676 for the area between the tangent function and the cosine function. And maybe just to briefly show you what we found again, remember, here's our graph of the tangent function. And here's y equals 1, and here's 2 cosine x coming down here like this i over 4, and so we found this little area between the two curves is about 1.0676 because we just integrated the difference of the two functions after finding which one is on top during the interval we're interested in. Well, sometimes we're faced with finding the area between two curves, and it's the case that those two curves cross each other several times during the interval that we're interested in. And so let's see how to deal with this situation. So now, for finding the area between two curves, I've shown the graphs of two functions. The one in blue-green is f, and the one in yellow is g. So you see the f, it wanders up and down, and the yellow one, g, it wanders up and down, and they actually cross each other several times during the interval x equal a to x equal b. And so if I wanted to actually find this area that's trapped between now, and here it would, this is the area we're talking about, then you see this area, by our previous formula, it's changing back and forth as to which is on top. And so in order to actually accomplish this, we have to find these points where the curves cross. Now, notice where the curves cross, that's the same as setting f of x equal to g of x, finding all those possible solutions. Once I've found every possible solution, and if I know and I'm certain I've found every possible solution, then I can integrate f of x minus g of x from a to c1, the first crossing point. And notice, even if I didn't check to see that f was on top, if f was on the bottom or if I had mistakenly computed the integral of g minus f, I would have to get the negative of this area. If I compute the integral from c1 to c2 of f minus g, I'll get the negative of this area. If I compute g minus f, I'll get the positive of that area. If I integrate from c2 to c3, then if I put f minus g, I'll get the area. If I put g minus f, I get the negative of the area, and likewise here. And so consequently, the last integral would be the integral from c3 to b, of g minus f, but if I accidentally put f minus g, it would come out negative. 
If I'm sure that those are the only crossing points, notice I can compute each one of those integrals. If it comes out negative, I know the only mistake I made was the order, and reverse, reversing the order would simply change the sign. So I just knock off the negative sign if it comes out. So in effect, once I've found these crossing points, the area between the two curves is the absolute values of, this, of the integral from each of these successive points. In other words, in effect, I can take the integral from A to C1, take that absolute value, uh, integral from F minus G, take the absolute value of the integral of F minus G from C1 to C2, take the absolute value of the integral of F minus G from C2 to C3, and the absolute value of the integral of F minus G from C3 to B. But here's the catch. If I make one mistake and leave out one of those crossing points or miss one, then what's going to happen is if I integrate from, uh, for instance, C1 to C3, this area would uh, say I'm using F minus G. Well, over here I'm getting positive area. Back here I'd be getting negative area. The two are going to tend to cancel each other, and it might come out you know, slightly positive, making me think that I did it right, or it might come out slightly negative and I just switched the, time, the sign. In either case, I've missed a whole lot of the area. So you really have to be careful when you're using this technique. Find every crossing point. Now, it is the case that I can simply express the area as the definite integral from A to B of the absolute value of f of x minus g of x dx, because notice if I look at that integrand, it equals f of x minus g of x between A and C1. It equals g of x minus f of x between C1 and C2. It equals the f of x minus g of x between C2 and C3. And it equals the g of x minus f of x between C3 and B. The problem is we don't have any formula for anti-differentiating the absolute value of a function in terms of the antiderivative of that function. So the only thing this formula is good for is just to remind us that when you see this area computation, you're going to have to find out all the crossing points so that you can eliminate this absolute value and effect put it on the outside. That is, in the end, I could say this area is the definite integral from A to the f first crossing point, F minus G, absolute value, plus the definite integral from C1 to C2 of f minus g absolute value plus the definite integral from c2 to c3 of f minus g, take the absolute value of the result, plus the definite integral from c3 to b of f minus g, take the absolute value of the result. In other words, once I found all the crossing points, I don't have to be so careful. Of course, it helps to know which is on top so that you don't make any mistakes, but in any case, this is the way that we find the area between two curves when they cross. We have to find all those crossing points and break up the integral into a sequence of integrals over different intervals. Well, let's look at an actual application here. I want to find the area between the functions f of x equal 2x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 7x squared minus 3x plus 2 and g of x equal x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus 2, and the vertical lines x equals negative 1 and x equals 3. Well, remember, we have to find where these functions cross. That is, we want to solve f of x equals g of x, or equivalently, set f of x minus g of x equal to 0 and solve. That means begin by computing f of x minus g of x anyway. That's what we're going to have to compute anyway, so compute it. Once you've computed it, we look to see where it's zero. Now, in this case, we're dealing with polynomials, so to find out where they're zero is to factor them. So look, f of x minus g of x, we have 2x to the fourth minus x to the fourth is simply x to the fourth. Uh, negative 3x cubed minus 2x cubed is negative 5x cubed. 7x squared minus no x squares is still 7x squared negative 3x minus no x is still negative 3x, and 2 minus 2 is nothing. So here's the difference of f of x and g of x. 
x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 7x squared minus 3x. That looks pretty bad at first, but notice there's no constant term, so we can immediately factor out an x, and we're down to a cubic polynomial. Now, cubic polynomials are, in general, not easy to solve, but there is a formula for solving cubic polynomials. I don't think you want to try and look it up. The simplest way to go is to look for a root, a, th a number that makes it zero. So try it, the simple ones. Zero isn't going to work because that will leave us with negative three. So the next simplest number to try is x equal one. One minus five plus seven minus three is zero. Uh, that is, one and seven is eight, and negative five and negative three is negative eight. They add up to zero. That means x minus one is a factor, and so we factor out x minus one. That is, by division of polynomials, we can divide x minus one into this polynomial and find the other factor of is x squared minus four x plus three. If you don't remember how to divide one polynomial into another, you might want to review that, but in any case, as soon as you find one root of a cubic polynomial, you have the problem solved because then the other factor is only quadratic, and you can always use the quadratic formula even if you don't see how to factor. But this one's easy to factor. x squared minus 4x plus 3 is simply x minus 1 times x minus 3. Notice we have two factors of x minus 1. In this case, we say 1 is a double root of the polynomial. So let's come over here and look at this. We have f of x minus g of x equals x times the quantity x minus 1 squared times x minus 3. Now remember what we need to integrate really is f of x minus g of x in absolute value. So in effect, what we're trying to do is figure out where is this expression positive and where is it negative. So let's just schematically make ourselves a little picture here. We know it's 0 when x equals 0, when x equals 1, or when x equals 3. So 0 here at x equals 0, 0 at x equals 1, 0 at x equals 3. Now, if I were to take a very big x, say x a billion, obviously the negative 1 and the negative 3 are immaterial, and putting that big a number in there is going to give us a big positive number, so it's obviously positive out here. Notice the only way this can change sign is to pass through 0 because it's a perfectly continuous function, and the intermediate value theorem guarantees that we can't go from positive to negative without going through 0, and the only place we can go through 0 here is 3. That means we're positive all the way to 3. Now, what happens as we move from the very right side of 3 to the slightly to the left? x minus 3 goes from positive to negative. This factor changes sign. x is still positive here, so that's still positive, and likewise x minus 1 is still positive, and squared anyway is still positive. So when I go from the right side of 3 to the left side, this entire expression changes from positive to negative. And now, as I come to x equals 1, this factor, x minus 1, is going to change sign. As I go from the right side of 1 to the left side, all the other factors stay the same. But because the x minus 1 is squared, there will be no resulting sign change to the f of x minus g of x itself, so we're still negative. And now when I get back here to my left edge that I'm interested in, x equal negative 1, what happens is I cross through from the right side of 0 to the left side of 0. That x changes sign. All the other things stay the same, and so it will become positive. In other words, without even making any uh, calculations, just from the basic principles of continuity and in the intermediate value theorem, I can see that this graph has to do something like this. Comes down here like this, comes down to some minimum, comes back up, and it hits 0 right here, the value 0 when x equals 1, but it can't cross through the horizontal axis, so it has to dip back down again, and then comes back up through 0. 
Notice this is a typical picture for a fourth degree curve. But in any case, it's told us everything we need to know to accomplish our integration. The integrand is positive on the interval negative one to one to zero. It's negative on the interval from zero all the way to three. And so that tells us our area is equal to the integral from negative one to zero of f of x minus g of x plus, well, over in this range from zero to three, this difference is negative, and so we want to multiply by negative one times the integral from zero to three of f of x minus g of x dx. So now we see what we have to calculate. We want to take this expression, or coming back over here where we started, the expression is x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 7x squared minus 3x. We want to integrate it from negative 1 to 0, and then again we want to integrate it from 0 to 3 and reverse the sign of that second integral result. Once we've done that, we add the two numbers, and that gives us the total area between the two curves. We'll do that next. Okay, remember our strategy now. We have found the crossing points of these two graphs. They touch at x equals 0, and at x equals 1, and at x equals 3. And of course, we're integrating from negative 1 to 3. We were interested in the area between the two curves from x equal negative 1 to x equal 3. And the crossing points are 0, 1, and 3. Now, what we found by analyzing the signs was that the only crossing points we really have to worry about are 0 and 3. And since we're only integrating to 3, it's only 0 we have to worry about. That is, we integrate from negative 1 to 0 our difference will have a constant sign over that interval, so whatever sign the integral comes out, we just drop that sign and keep the absolute value of the result. And then from 0 to 3, we do the same thing. So now, the integral we have to work with first is negative 1 to 0 of the f minus g. Remember, that's x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 7x squared minus 3x dx. And so we just anti-differentiate that. Antiderivative of x to the fourth is x to the fifth over five minus five fourths x to the fourth for the antiderivative of five x cubed. Antiderivative of seven x squared, that'll be seven thirds x cubed. And then the antiderivative of negative three x will be negative three halves x squared. Now this has to be evaluated from negative 1 to 0. Obviously when I put 0 in for x, everything comes out 0, minus what we get by putting in x equal negative 1. Notice that the even powers here have negative signs in front of them, and the negative 1 will be just changed to a 1. The odd powers have positive signs, and you put negative 1 in for x, and in an odd power, and it's negative 1. So this will be negative a fifth minus 5 fourths minus 7 thirds minus 3 halves. So negative a fifth, negative 5 fourths minus 7 thirds minus 3 halves. So the negative here in front changes all these negatives to positive. We've done it in the right order over here for the first interval. So consequently, we have one fifth plus five fourths plus seven thirds plus three halves. If we put this all over a common denominator, you'll find that's 317 sixtieths. So that's the first integral we have to deal with. Well, what's the next one we have to deal with? The next one is the integral from zero to three. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to erase these limits. We're integrating that difference from 0 to 3. I know that the sign of the difference is the same throughout, namely it's negative, so by keeping that integrand there, we're really going to come out, we know, with a negative number. But the point is, because I know nothing matters for crossing in that interval, if the sign comes out negative, I'm just going to drop it. So that means we have the same antiderivative here, I just have to change the limits. 
So now our limits are 0 to 3. So let's erase this and do it again. So this time, I'll get what I get by putting in the upper limit 3. That's 3 to the fifth over 5 minus 5 fourths times 3 to the fourth plus 7 thirds times 3 cubed minus 3 halves times 3 squared. When we calculate this, now you see we have negative signs in front of the square terms and uh, turns out that in the end, what we'll get in this case is negative 63 twentieths. And so consequently, what that tells us is we know we did that. We integrated f of x minus g of x over this interval where the f of x is actually below. And so we know we should have done g of x minus f of x, and that would just change the side. So the end result, I'll cross off the equal sign. This is not equal to this, but this is the area that we're interested in over that next interval. So the total area we have is the sum of the two. That's the 317 sixtieths plus, and if I put that one in sixtieths, that's 189 sixtieths. And that turns out to cancel a little bit, and we get 253 thirtieths. Now, if you divide that in, what you get is 8.4333 dot, 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 add on infinitum, or as we sometimes like to write, 8.43 with a bar over it, indicating that those threes go on forever. So that's the area between those two curves. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to find it, but notice once you've found all those crossing points and once you are confident that you know you have them all, then you just integrate from crossing point to crossing point and don't worry about the sign coming out negative just like I did. Once the sign comes out negative on the definite integral, you just drop that negative sign and keep adding up the absolute values of the results. And so when you do it that way, notice you only have to figure out the antiderivative of the difference once, and then you just simply change the limits from the next sequence of crossing points and go on calculating. Well, now that you've seen how these are worked, you might want to try some of these on your own.